Hello, everybody, and welcome to this month's RSA webinar. Uh, sorry, it's taken a little while to call you in. We had a bit of technical issues and family issues as well. Uh, not a good combination. Uh, anyway, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Dr. Meredith Doig, and I'm president of the Rationalist Society, which is Australia's oldest free thought uh, organisation. And uh, before we begin, I'd like to invite you all to join with us in acknowledging the traditional owners of the or custodians of country throughout Australia and to acknowledge their continuing connections to land and sea and the community. Now, tonight, I'm really delighted to have with us Dr. Josh Roos, who's a, an Associate Professor of Politics at the Alfred Deakin Institute for Citizen, Citizenship and Globalization at Deakin University. Now, Josh is a sociologist, and before you groan, can I assure you that he writes in plain English and he writes about topics which are really meaningful and important. Uh, topics like the emergence of the far right uh, in Australia and online anti-women movements. Josh has an international profile. He's presented his work to international organisations like the United Nations Development Programme, NATO, the International Centre for Counterterrorism at The Hague. He's held visiting positions at Harvard, at New York University and at Oxford. And he's been cited in the New York Times, the Washington Post, the BBC, The Economist, Al Jazeera, The Guardian, The Sydney Morning Herald, uh, and the ABC. And he's also been an advisor to both state and federal governments. Now, his latest book, and the one that we're going to focus on this evening, um, is called The New Demagogue. The New Demagogues, Religion, Masculinity and the Populist Epoch. As usual, Josh will present for about 20 minutes or so and then we'll head into Q&A. And uh, if there is a question that occurs to you as Josh is going through his presentation, then please feel free to um, pop it in the chat box and we'll be monitoring those questions and we'll try to get through as many of them as possible before the end of the presentation. As you know, I try to keep this to one hour, um, trying to recognize that it's late-ish in people's evenings and we want to let you go after one hour. Okay, is there anybody else to admit? Now, um, Josh, before I uh, share my screen with your presentation in it, can I just ask you to begin by letting our attendees know something of how you came to be an academic? Because it's not, in my view, it's not really the usual background um, to being an academic. Yeah, thank you. Um, and thank you for the introduction. Really, I suppose, an interesting... Uh, I, I, my parents are certainly not academics. Um, I was born at Westmead Hospital in Western Sydney and uh, my family were from very much working class New South Wales out in St Mary's and um, my father was a son of a minister. So my, my parents looked after kids who were wards of the state. We moved down to Melbourne um, and then I've basically worked my way through and played a lot of sport. I was in the army for some time. And, um, and then... Uh, in between, well, let me say I went through a, a socialist phase uh, at uni and then I joined the army and then I um, <laughs> went through and uh, I suppose just fell in love um, with not only ideas but um, the actual study of, you know, what was going on in the world. For me, 9-11 was really formative. Mm -hmm. um, I was 21. I, I still remember um, seeing the, the second plane fly into the tower and thinking that this is probably going to shape the world for the next 50 years. And um, it certainly is, and it still does. And so for me, I thought, well, on the one hand, I, I need to be able to protect my country if something happens. But on the other hand, I need to be able to understand you know, the real, the grassroots and, and the real dimensions of the problem um, and, and the challenges that were facing us. And, and growing up around, um, I had friends who were Muslim. And so I certainly knew it wasn't, certainly wasn't a problem necessarily with 
Muslims or Islam, but I wanted to understand what was driving it and driving radicalization. So that started a journey that for me has now gone for about 20 years. Mm. Um, and um, through that process, um, I've managed to somehow get a tenured job in academia, which is uh, almost impossible nowadays. And, um, and, and really, look, I get to travel internationally, I get to share ideas with amazing people and really try to break down complex ideas for the wider public, which I think is a really important responsibility. Um, and so I well, really enjoy it. Having, I haven't read your book um, in, in great detail, but I have um, perused through it. And can I say, I think that you really succeed. You do write in plain English about complicated ideas and uh, you draw them together and then analyse them extremely well. So I'd encourage everybody to uh, get hold of the new demagogues, religion, masculinity in the populist epoch. But Josh, I'm going to share the screen now with your so uh, presentation on it and invite you to go through that. Just hold, bear with me for one sec. Thank okay. you. Josh, I'm over just, to you. Thanks so much. And I'm just going to ask, like, just ask you to change slides every now and then. Sure. Um, and I'm going to intersperse, I'm going to go from speaking as um, coherently off the, off the top of my head as possible at times through to reading a little bit here and there. So bear with me. Uh, I'd just like to start by acknowledging uh, that I'm speaking from the land of the Rondri people of the Kulin Nations and pay my respects to elders past and present. Um, new slides, please. New slide. Thank you. So I'm going to basically start by talking, going backwards a little bit. I'm going to start talking about the current state of play. Uh, with violent extremism, uh, far-right populism, um, and then I'm going to look at how did we get here, what what really has driven this over the last, not like 10 or 20 years. I'm going to go back to the middle of the 20th century, and then I'm going to proceed forward, and then I'm going to ask about well, what are the next steps? Where do we go from here? Um, next slide, please. So we'd all be familiar with some of these faces. Um, what we've seen is the emergence of a global far-right populism, and that's, that's occurred across the, the Western world, um, but it's also occurred across the global south. It's, it's a global phenomenon, and we've seen the emergence, we see many women up here, but in particular in, in power of demagogic strongmen. In the United States, um, you don't see Trump. I think he got cut off in this slide, um, but we've, um, we've got Trump and then and, and opposing him for the... Um, opportunity to run for, for president, we see Ron DeSantis, who's just a smarter version of Trump, who's pushing an extremist agenda in, uh, from Florida. Uh, we see uh, individuals like Marjorie Taylor Greene. We've seen the US Supreme Court turn. Uh, we've seen the appointment of um, really anti-abortion judges. That was the crux of Trump getting elected. Uh, the evangelical support base uh, was one critical dimension. Although the other was a disenfranchised uh, rural working class, and, and um, I did field work for this book up in northern Pennsylvania, up in the Appalachian Mountains, and um, you've got people who voted the liberal, or as they see it, liberal, uh, the, the Democrats their whole lives. Their families had voted Democrats their whole lives, and at the 2016 election, they turned. And so we see this um, really stark division that's... Um, really become, um, it's, it's not just a north and south divide, it's a, a religious divide, it's a divide uh, based on who's winning and who's losing in the economy. There's, um, it's just an incredibly polarised place now. And unfortunately, having spent a fair bit of time there and, and loving the place for many different reasons, um, it is falling um, into a bit of a hole. And so we've seen, for example, the Conservative Political Action Conference, um, CPAC, uh, emerge over there and um, and that really involves um, many many extreme actors and I'll talk to that um, shortly as well um, and that's spread to Australia um, we now have an Australian CPAC with figures like uh, Latham and, and Tony Abbott and, um, and others um, we've seen the International Conference for Men emerge uh, this is a conference that talks about um, attacks on men and men's rights and the need to reassert um, the primacy of men uh, in society in Europe, France, uh, we've got Marine Le Pen, who's potentially not too far off winning uh, the presidency. Uh, in Hungary, Viktor Orban, um, who is aligning more and more with Russia against NATO. In uh, Italy, Giorgia Maloney, uh, extreme far right um, prime minister, running with the Brothers of Italy. In Sweden, the Swedish Democrats, I mean, 
I never thought I'd see a far right emerging in Sweden in my lifetime to the extent that we have. Um, obviously, Nigel Farage and others in the UK. So what we're seeing here are political leaders um, embracing a far right rhetoric and narrative about the, the shape and the dimension of the world and its problems. They've all got someone to blame. And I'll, I'll talk to that shortly as well. But really, this is, this is shaping the world around us. And whilst we've seen some short-term wins, we've seen the left, um, um, if, if you can call it a win, um, regaining some of, these, some of these countries, at least for the short term, this is a problem that's not going away. And today, I'm going to talk a little bit more about that as well. But I do want to give you an overview now. Uh, next slide, please of extremism and violent extremism um, across the Western democracies as well. So really democracy can tolerate extreme perspectives. And, and in fact, it's a strength in that people can hold extreme and contrasting views. And um, obviously um, at the end of the day, agree to disagree. But really what we see here is the attempt to enact and impose uh, those views on others. And, and through the use of force in particular. And that's where we need to really stop and, and take stock of what's going on. We also need a broader conceptualization of violence because what we're seeing here isn't necessarily a physical violence, but it's a violent rhetoric and symbology. And it's imbued with history and imbued with, um, with hatred. And, and again, this is a really critical dimension to the problem because what we're seeing is people self-centering and and implying violence in, in many ways that we're not necessarily seeing. So I've talked a little bit about CPAC as an extremist organization. Uh, they've had Steve Bannon, Prince Ribas, Trump, DeSantis, Marjorie Taylor Green attending. The Australian version has had um, Abbott, Mark Latham, Craig Kelly. Uh, globally, we've seen um, CPAC chapters pop up in Brazil, uh, Japan, Mexico, and South Korea. And so these are forms of extremism that are imbued um, and inherently um, violent, but aren't explicitly violent. The rhetoric and the ideas uh, encompass a really um, strong vision of the future, which is highly not only polarised and divided, but exclusionary. You know? and, and they've got an enemy that they're seeking to enact their agenda against. So then we can go to traditional violent extremism. And, and the state of play here, again, is constantly evolving in a way that um, is um, unprecedented in, in many respects in Australian history and, and potentially across the West. So we've still got Salafi jihadism uh, as an issue. Um, up to 230 Australian Muslims departed to join the Islamic State movement uh, between 2014 and, and 2017. And several hundred more had their passports confiscated and were charged with terror plots. Um, we've seen numerous terror plots inspired by the Islamic State um, carried out internationally but also here in Australia and whilst the Islamic State have been defeated as a land force um, slowing down their attempts to recruit we've seen a, um, a significant um, rise in, in the last couple of years of Al-Qaeda and Islamic State um, spread and attempt to continue to recruit across Western contexts albeit far less successfully and importantly we see many of the same conditions that facilitated their their recruitment, successful recruitment, still here. Securitisation and surveillance, negative media, hostile and political discourse, economic disadvantage and, and lack of opportunity and, and so on. And that's exactly what their, their narratives were targeting, uh, evoking anger, evoking uh, masculinity uh, and, and really um, talking about a, a war on Islam. Mm -hmm. And so going almost full circle, because there are increasingly strong parallels between the far right and Salafi jihadism, um, we've now got a, a far right um, of some, whom some members are converting to Islam, so, um, like hardline Islam, um, because they see it as embodying many of the same characteristics that they wish they had in the far right. So Sherman Burgess being one case, and he was uh, recently, or several years ago, was arrested and charged for burning a, an effigy of the Prophet Muhammad. Now he's converted to, the, um, converted to Islam. Um, so we see an evolution from 2015 onwards and, and, and the far right really emerged in a context where people were emboldened by the election of Donald Trump, um, but also the Brexit. And if you go back, it's hard to believe, almost eight years, uh, you know, these were really defining issues. 
mm. uh, Trump, a Trump presidency on the cards, um, the Brexit uh, or the you know EU referendum. Um, these were really significant cleavages. We take them for granted now. But a multi, we've seen a multitude of groups form um, last several years and then dissolve. Um, and they, they dissolve in many respects under the, the weight of their own contradictions. Uh, these are groups um, run by narcissists, men who seek power, just absolutely desire um, adoration from their followers that need to be put up on a pedestal uh, to be the next Fuhrer and, and, and to be the next um, leader of the, the, the Australian Reich. And, and, and so they, they constantly, uh, so there's a lot of infighting about who that top dog is going to be. But they've, they've merged and evolved over the last eight years. Um, to net what we now have, uh, we had the United Patriots Front and the Lad Societies, which was based on the Proud Boys. But now we have a, um, a group um, called the National Socialist Network who are um, basically outright Nazis who dress in black. You remember the, the protest in Melbourne with mm -hmm. the, um, the raised arms popping up um, at the footsteps of Jewish suburbs and, and doing the Hitler salute and, and so on. And they seek to provoke but they also seek to inspire fear amongst um, members of our community. Um, we've seen several counter arrests in Australia under counterterrorism legislation with the far right. We also devastatingly saw the Christchurch terrorist, um, Brenton Tarrant, um, also um, go out- He who shall Australia. not be named. Yeah, I, I have no problem naming him because I think at the end of the day, this is an Anglo-Australian and we need to ad adopt a level of societal responsibility for what we've produced. Mm -hmm. And in his case, um, this is a, a country boy who got drawn into that world, travelled the world, went to another country to carry out a deadly terror attack. And I think the, the lack of introspection about him and, and where he's come from is, is really um, alarming. Mm -hmm. um, almost in recent years, almost half the ASIO caseload has been focused on the Australian far right, although that's, that's decreasing as they look to foreign interference. And it's important to understand the international... Um, dimension to the Australian far right. They are linked internationally. Um, they draw many of their ideas and much of their inspiration in particular from the US far right, mm -hmm. and much of their vocabulary and symbology. And there's many cases of them meeting in Telegram and, and other online forums to discuss tactics and discuss their, their ideal future. Internationally with the far right, I mean, it goes without saying, we're talking about the Proud Boys, the Oath Keepers, Militiamen, the Boogaloo Boys, and it all came to a head under Trump with the um, January 6th storming of the Capitol building, um, where they, they really saw it was, it was a paradoxical sort of event where they achieved far more than anyone ever anticipated, but they were probably so disorganised that they didn't exploit it to the extent that they could have, thankfully. Um, and, and so that has really given momentum locally to, to actors. There are many people who draw inspiration from January 6th here. There are many people who draw inspiration from um, that um, success of a, an extreme far-right president um, who, who are now sort of working in the background to achieve that. Mm. We've also seen new manifestations. We've got the alt-right. Everyone would have heard of the alt-right. Um, people like Richard Spencer who are heavy on memes and vocabulary. But also the alt-right is really a move away from the skinhead um, jackboot to leather work, jacket wearing, swastika wearing sort of thug to a almost respectable face. Men in suits wearing little labels with various memes on them uh, are seeking to build their audience amongst um, white collar uh, middle class kids as opposed mm -hmm. to potentially a, a working class. So in the Australian context, you know, in terms of new manifestations, we've now got freedom convoys and, and protests. Uh, we've got the My Place movement spin off. Uh, which has emerged uh, in recent uh, months out of Frankston. Did you say uh, My Place? My Place. I hadn't heard of that. Yes. So My Place is a um, uh, attempts to cast itself as this sort of community grassroots organisation and movement. Uh, they hold farmers markets. They, um, you know, they talk a lot about love. They've got their own website where they talk about love. But then you start to dig beneath the surface um, heavily anti-vaccination, conspiracy-laden, um, sharing of anti-Semitic memes and, and material on their Telegram chats. And, and increasingly, it becomes evident that beyond the um, socially acceptable spin-off um, and, and framing uh, that they attempt to cast, 
that this is a movement that has extremist ideologies and, and, consp and adopt conspiracy theories. And this, is this a homegrown Australian place or is it a spin-off from somewhere else? I'd call it the Hillsong of um, conspiracy movements um, <laughs> and, and freedom movements. Um, it is new and it's attempting to build internationally. Um, and much like Hillsong, it's had a little bit of success here and there. Hmm. Um, but there's been some good coverage of it in, in, um, in the media in the last couple of uh, months, hmm. um, looking at its emergence. And again, um, for that reason, because it appears to be socially uh, progressive in some ways, talking about the need to protect our farmers, the need to you know, develop our, um, our products locally and, and so on, it's attractive to middle class um, uh, men and women and upper middle class men and women. And so we're seeing some people being drawn into that orbit hmm. who traditionally wouldn't be drawn into this space. Um, and then we're As with a number of other cults. Exactly right. And so we're talking about uh, conspiracy theorists. Everyone's heard of QAnon by now. Uh, Australia was the third or fourth largest country in terms of subscription to the ideas of QAnon. And if you're not familiar with it, it's this idea that there's this global elite um, who are incredibly powerful behind that elite. Uh, they're all Jewish, of course, in, the, in that world. Um, and uh, they're, they're all pedophiles and they, they eat children. <laughs> they drink their blood. They extract chemical essences from, um, from the children and, and use them. And again, um, this concept of Pizzagate, um, the most recent version of Pizzagate, well, the idea of Pizzagate was that there was a particular pizza restaurant where all this was occurring, which actually inspired a shooting out the front of that, that restaurant. But um, with the Tucker Carlson um, being um, sacked no. from Fox News, he was eating a pizza in his last interview. <laughs> and apparently now this is all, all linked. And Trump had pizza that night too. So this as, is as did probably 320 million other Americans. Uh, exactly right. <laughs> so we're talking about that. We're talking about 5G towers. We're talking about chemtrails, the idea that planes are somehow shooting out you know, poisonous chemicals to put, um, and so on. I believe you had Vivian Duran recently uh, talk um, and mm -hmm. she's an expert on militant wellness. And that's this world that um, you've got actors like Pete Evans in um, who was cast wearing a, um, a far right symbol t-shirt. Um, these are um, often middle-class women who's, who um, for all intents and purposes would never be drawn into this orbit, but it's laden with conspiracy theories. It's laden with a particularly um, right-wing sort of outlook on life. And we're talking about sovereign citizens, and I, I, I'm cognizant of time. I mean, I could go on. There's many. Yes, I it, it, look. <laughs> we do need to move on because I want to leave a bit of time for questions. Yeah. So can I can I just encourage everybody to get the book because mm. all of this is laid out and it's really really well done. But Josh, please continue. Yeah. Well, I'll talk I'll very quickly. Just touch mm. up on the emergence of sovereign citizens here in Australia. Um, who you know are about 15% of domestic terror cases in the US. Um, and there's a strong suggestion that beyond the sort of fundamentalist Christian orientation um, to the Riambella um, terrorists, um, also they have a sovereign citizen sort of dimension to them as well. Um, we've got the Manosphere, anti-women online movements, men's mm -hmm. rights activists, men going their own way who reject women for anything other than sexual um, uh, enjoyment, pickup artists, influencers like Andrew Tate, mm. incels, um, and then obviously the emergence of new forms of fundamentalist Christianity, um, and not the, just beyond the old anti-abortion activists, we're seeing militant Catholicism, which I call uh, the Catholicists, uh, Catholic Lives Matters, um, who are now in, um, very active up in Sydney and, um, and attacking, for example, trans rights rallies. So this is all happening you know, simultaneously. Um, in many respects, if you can please go to the next slide. So really what we're going to look at is what is the front line? What do they all stand for? And, and what's, what's co um, common across them all? And, and gender is a really important dimension here. Uh, we're talking about women's rights. You mean rights. gender or sex? Um, I'm, well, I'm talking gender in, in many respects because we're, there's a preoccupation with trans, mm -hmm. um, trans rights and, and, and the fact that um, there, there's two dimensions there. There's the... Um, feminist uh, response and then there's the far right response and there's a, a lack of um, understanding in the wider community about the differences between the two, for example. Mm -hmm. um, but then we're talking about an anti-feminist backlash as well. Um, this neo-traditionalism that infuses everything from Salafi Jihadism, the far right, anti-women actors, 
um, sovereign citizens, the idea that women belong in the home, producing babies, keeping house while the men are out there as warriors fighting. Um, there's an anti-LGTBIQ rights backlash. There's a distrust of science. There's a powerful anti-Semitism on the rise again. Um, and they're, they're inherently anti-democratic. There's mm -hmm. not only distrust of government, but there's an idea that government um, is inherently against the people as they say it. They, they'll talk a lot about the freedom and, and the people and, and so on. So that's, that's what really brings them together. And, and we've got, I suppose when we're trying to un, unravel and untangle these questions, we have to, and we, I'd, I'd encourage everyone to keep in mind, if this is what they're standing against, what societal condition brought them to this mm -hmm. point? So if we could please go to the next slide. I'm just not sure to have a coffee or a water. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to go back in time, uh, back to the 40s, um, where we're emerging from the, the devastation of the Second World War, particularly um, in the UK with the, the Blitz and, and so on. So there was a report by Sir William Breveridge um, titled The Social Insurance and um, Allied Services um, um, Report. And it sought to address both poverty and the characteristics believed to lead to poverty. Uh, Beveridge was a liberal with Fabian Socialist links and a former director of the uh, London School of Economics, um, which he then left to relocate to Oxford. So Beveridge was also, however, influenced by Archbishop William Temple, an Anglican theologian, and the Archbishop of Canterbury. Temple was a close friend of another professor, R.H. Tawney, and became friends with Beveridge. So there's, the, the point here is that there's this interconnectedness of these great minds at the London School of Economics, but also um, across uh, Oxford and Cambridge um, at the time. And so that, that picture at the top is uh, London School of Economics at night. And so we, from this, group, this cluster, um, we saw, um, for example, Temple um, first used the, the, the phrase, the welfare state in his book, Christianity in the Social Order. And he called for universal access to health, education, housing, dignified conditions of work and democratic representation. And in the preface of the book, he acknowledged the intellectual contribution of uh, John Maynard Keynes. Mm -hmm. His report, the Beveridge Report, is considered a key intellectual influence on the welfare state. And that focused again on universal access to education, insurance scheme and the creation of the National Health Service. And, uh, and, and the report term used this concept of social rights, which is geared to a particular operation of the economy based on state intervention, so big government. And um, a letter from Keynes to Beveridge made that clear. Your general scheme leaves me in a wild state of enthusiasm. I think of it as a vast constructive reform of real importance and I'm relieved to find that it is financially possible. So Keynes, who, who, who witnessed the Great Depression, challenged the neoclassical economic presumption that free markets provide full employment. And in his 1936 work, he argued that the Great Depression had been caused by a drop in aggregate demand that could have been countered by increased government spending. So basically, in a nutshell, these great minds were, were really arguing that we not only need big government, we need a strongly interventionist government, and we need to look after the rights um, of, of working people. And, and, and citizenship in that age was really a package of rights and responsibilities. So this did focus primarily on the white working male, but it was a basis for a society that looked after as vulnerable, particularly when they were out of, out of work. But then we have this opposing side um, that emerged, particularly out of the Chicago School, which is the uh, university to the bottom and, and responsible for many of the rows inflicted upon the world um, in many respects over a number of years. Um, and the Chicago School, I mean, interestingly, the, the two great minds, um, and, and they are great minds even for what they've sort of achieved, uh, were Frederick Hayek and uh, um, Milton Friedman. And, and Hayek, who was actually at um, the London School of Economics at one point um, with Keynes, and, um, and he actually wrote, um, when, when Keynes read his book, The Road to Serfdom, um, he, he uh, wrote to Hayek, so ask, arguing for the restoration of right moral thinking. So we saw the Chicago School emerge um, with those two individuals. And, um, and both contributed to the formation of a classical liberal anti-government intervention free market think tank known as the Mont Pelerin uh, Society. Uh, and they both worked at the University of Chicago during the formation of what we now call neoliberalism. The work of Hayek and Friedman extended well beyond monetarism and markets and it provided an alternative paradigm to citizenship for the organisation of society. 
And that, and that's, um, that really became influential with not only Thatcher and Reagan, but also professional politicians from the left who appropriated this thinking. Uh, and I'm thinking here of um, Hawke, I'm thinking of Keating, I'm thinking of uh, Blair and um, uh, yeah, Schroeder, I think is uh, in Germany. So a number of um, uh, left-leaning politicians also embraced these ideas. And so what we saw um, is that I suppose we could argue that Friedman subscribed to an evolutionary psychology. He viewed morality as a product of natural selection that facilitates cooperation and collaboration. And that corresponded with his perspective that the market acts as a form of financial natural selection or survival of the fittest. Hmm. So from this, we saw really basically bare naked capitalism at its, at its heart. It's uh, sort of the, the origin of the term economic rationalism. Yeah, I mean, that's a, that's a part of the sort of argument that, um, you know, you've got to make cuts. Yeah, everything has got to keep the economy ticking over. Um, mm. I suppose emerging out of that was um, austerity, mm -hmm. the concept of austerity as well, which has just ripped apart working classes, particularly in the UK, working class communities. Mm -hmm. So what we've seen from that is the, if, if you look at, the world in that that blanket term of um, it's, it's a free market. It's, the free markets have to run completely freely. Right? There can't be any any form of intervention in them at all. Government's got to remain small. So key societal institutions that were formed on the basis in, or operated on the basis that um, they had a role to play in society and in the market, uh, including trade unions, which offered a sense of solidarity to working people and a, a sense of um, belonging uh, and, and an intellectual base for their, their challenges and, and churches, um, which offered a sense of social solidarity uh, in a very gendered and patriarchal manner. Male was the, the breadwinner, um, head of the household, community and, and so on. Trade unions were standing at around 50% of the population um, in, the, in the 60s um, in Australia, um, up and down 30, 40, oh, sorry, 40, 50, 55% across the West or the Anglosphere. Our church attendance was similar, around that 40-50% mark. And in Australia, for example, trade union membership now is around 10% and it's prom primarily women in public service roles. Mm -hmm. And if you're looking at church attendance, um, various surveys will tell you it's more, but it's probably closer to 10%. And it's um, certainly high, more, higher amongst more recent migrants, leading to a, an increased conservatism mm -hmm. because they've come from context with high conservatism. So what we've seen is this consistent attack on workers' rights and conditions. And we've seen a feminization of the economy. We've seen, um, maybe if you could please go to the next slide, I might have actually needed you to go there. Yeah. So um, we've seen, um, you know, the feminization of the economy and work. So this interesting paradox to neoliberalism or, or monetarism is this, um, this um, thing where working men, in particular blue collar men, have faced significant challenges. White collar men are increasingly facing this idea that there's no longer the idea of the company man, this idea of a guaranteed middle management job. And so we're, we're seeing this, um, this job for life and, and they're now facing competition uh, from women who are doing incredibly well, educated, intelligent women are now competing on more equal terms, not entirely equal. And certainly there's that, that salary gap, but they're now being forced to confront um, that, um, now, not only are they operating precarious employment with contracts, but they're now competing against an entire um, gender effectively in many respects for the same jobs. And, and so that's bred this sort of deep-seated resentment. Um, and, and so there's not only, it's not blue collar men who are going home and getting online and abusing and harassing women, for example, at nighttime. Um, it's, it's certainly um, more likely to be um, white collar men um, who, you know, resent the, the impositions that they're facing as they see it. So very briefly, because I know we've got to wrap this up for conversation uh, in the next five minutes. Um, I will talk briefly to just the emergence of new communication technologies and, and the role that they're playing. In 2001, um, about a billion people, roughly, or 960 million, about 16% of the population owned a mobile phone. Um, that's just 22 years ago. It's now, there are now more phones on the planet than there are people. In, um, in terms of the internet, 9% of the world's population had access to the internet in 2001. In 2021, um, two thirds of people, 66% had access. 
Facebook went from several hundred users in the early 2000s to 2.9 billion users in 2021. Twitter went from several hundred to 200 million users in 2021. But here's the real uh, um, momentum. We're talking encrypted messaging apps like Telegram, which allow the free flow, uncensored passage of material and information. Uh, went from approximately several hundred users in just 2013 to having now well over 600 to 700 million users globally. Hmm. Um, this is like unprecedented in human history, this, this form of communication technology. And the passage of ideas and extreme ideas bringing people not only into contact with each other who might hold those extreme ideas, but also overloading and overwhelming people with information. Um, and, and new forms of communication technology like TikTok are allowing extreme messaging and content to hit, hit people in their bedrooms, in their homes, on the bathroom, whatever they're doing when they're looking at their phone. And, and it's being packaged up in a, in, a, in a very trendy sort of cute manner. Um, but these are ex often extreme ideas. So people aren't educated to think critically through these challenges. And in the context of a vacuum from the uh, decline of trade unions, churches, other societal institutions, social media is filling that gap. So where to from here? Last slide, please. So, um, obviously, the economy continues to become um, increasingly um, problematic. Uh, during um, COVID, for example, our richest people, um, like Jenna Reinhart, increased her wealth by $20 billion, um, going from $16 million up to $36 billion. Quiggy Forest doubled his wealth. Three million Australians, however, withdrew more than $37 billion from their superannuation. We have a cost of living crisis. Um, we have a transfer of wealth from uh, the young to the old uh, in many respects um, due to the housing crisis. Um, divisions now between the inner and outer cities. Rural Australia is increasingly problematic so far as the emergence of extreme groups uh, as locals can't buy in the towns that they grew up in because of in big city investors coming in and, and turning their homes into um, Airbnbs. Um, social media, there's a continued failure to regulate. Encrypted messaging apps uh, are really problematic for that uptake of extremist content. There's an increase in textualism as people go back to the source, looking for, for a sense of belief and solidarity and, and belonging. Um, and they're particularly powerful in the US, but on the rise here in Australia. There's an increase in religious nationalism um, internationally, India, Russia, Poland, all embracing a uh, religious dimension. We're talking about environmental catastrophe and violent extremism. <laughs> Josh, this is overwhelming. <laughs> well, this is my world. <laughs> I, I, I can I can see Pat McCarthy there who who's just getting more and more depressed listening to it all. I'm almost done. That's the bright side. Because <laughs> um, I know that you've got suggestions for what we can do. Well, that's right. This. I mean, and, and the last couple, we're talking about environmental catastrophe, foreign interference and sowing the seeds of discord as nation states, we're talking about high intensity regional conflict um, mm. cards as well. Really what I argue here is that governments need to be more interventionist. We need bigger, more interventionist government, uh, prepared to bite the bullet and, and go against the logic of the free market, which has been, become orthodox. They need to be revolutionary and break out of it a little bit more. They need to also reclaim citizenship um, as a package of not only rights, but responsibilities. Mm. Um, and, and really re require calibrated evidence-based policies that you know, encourage the private sector, but the private sector has increasingly lacked any form of accountability to, to wider society. And, and so we really need to develop meaningful training, secure work, offering upward social trajectories, and that might require subsidies, and that's a dirty word nowadays. Um, in, in fact, the entire car industry shut down on that basis. Um, you know, there might be a measure of state coercion intervention in the economy to ensure the survival of the right to industrial citizenship, mm. uh, where people actually have real white rights at work, um, and, and we can actually start to rebuild some of these societal institutions. We need to look backwards, to look forwards, learn from what used to work, what used to cohere, and, and actually look at um, what brings us together going forward as well. And our diversity is a strength. Our, um, you know, our sense of belonging and, and sense of um, critical thinking about our country and our future is actually a really important task that we're going through, including the voice process. 
um, that actually builds a level of social cohesion and, and builds a, an Australia that's looking forward, not looking back, not got this nostalgic sense of great loss, got this sense of um, grief about what was had that they no longer have, and actually something to look forward to, something to aspire to. Mm-hmm. And that's really what political leadership's about, and that's been lacking in this country for, for generations. Mm. Um, but also what we need is that sense of um, government, like the, the, the bravery or the courage, intervene in the economy and to take on and to tax big nap corporate, not massive corporate um, multinationals and, and others um, that really, um, and, and to call a spade a spade to act um, rather than talk about acting. So going forward, I'm, I'm, I am optimistic. These are all some of the challenges we're facing, but I do think that there is a way forward out of this. Thank you. Josh, thank you so much for that. Um, there's a heck of a lot in it, but we do have some questions that I'd like to get into. There's some in the uh, chat box and some people have sent in questions beforehand. But if I might, I, I'd like to um, kick off because when I was reading through your book, it, it is about demagogues, that is the the, the strong men, right? And um, it reminded me of uh, my brief uh, flirtation with Max Weber, who's a very famous foundational sociologist. And Weber talked about three forms of social uh, authority being charismatic, traditional, and rational. So the, the, the demagogues, the strong men, are the sort of charismatic type of leadership and then the traditional type is more um, the family or kings and queens. And then the rational is the more sort of forms of bureaucracy um, and the, the, uh, uh, the rule of law. But what Faber said is that there are legitimate ways of each of those forms of authority. And then there's illegitimate ways where it sort of becomes not authority but power and coercion. So my question is, um, in thinking about your idea of um, religion and masculinity and the the populism, right, are there legitimate forms of authority in those areas or are, are they, are there legitimate ways that religion exercises authority or masculinity exercises authority or populism exercises authority? Are there legitimate ways and then illegitimate ways? So in other words, are, are there good good aspects of those three things that you've identified um, as well as the negative aspects? Yeah, thanks, great question. And um, I haven't, oh, it's good to revisit Weber as well. Um, look, I think at their heart, all, all, populist, all politicians are populists. You have to be. You have to be more popular to win. Um, but there's this entire body of literature, and, and this has been going around in circles for the best part of 60 years, about, well, what is populism? And, and there's, it's actually hard to define um, beyond some basic sort of um, preconditions. You stand, it's what you stand against. Um, we, the people, against some sort of, Dark, dark, dark elite, we have an enemy um, and we have some sort of um, really powerful um, narrative about the past and, you know, come with me. You know, and, and that requires charisma um, mm. as a form of leadership, but it doesn't necessarily really require any sort of rational sort of legal authority. Mm. Uh, it doesn't require um, any form of traditional authority. I mean, most populists aren't traditionalists. They're actually quite radical in their, their vision. Almost uh, revolutionary. Yeah, I mean. As, as, as charismatic leaders often are. Yeah, and I, I argue that far-right populism in particular is just a, a, an empty shell. It's a tactic for those who aspire to power. Hmm. Um, it's a tactic for those who are seeking power at any cost to say and do whatever it takes. If you look at Trump's public statements 20 years ago or 25 years ago, he was hanging out with the, the Democrats. He was mm. making um, statements completely to the contrary. But now he's one of the most powerful men in the world to this day mm. um, because he's prepared to do and say what it takes. Um, 
uh, Tucker Carlson. Um, is it Tucker? Tucker Carlson? Um, yeah, Tucker Carlson. Yeah, I mean, he's on the record of saying how much he hated Trump, but what was he getting paid to do and say? I mean, you know, people who aspire to power, it's an empty, uh, empty power, devoid of any form of real ideological underpinning other than to aspire to hold it and to possess it and to wield it. Hmm. And, and what we see with, um, I suppose, look, there is certainly, you know, um, like power, like the responsible and the, um, you know, charismatic. I mean, charisma is an important part of leadership, um, but, you know, you need to bring people with you. But it, it's really about um, bringing that power and centering it back on people, back on serving society, back on mm. building society up and um, to be cliche into attempting to make the world a better place. And, uh, and your idea of a, a reinvigorated citizenship yeah. really speaks to that. Yeah, well, it's yeah. about placing yeah. power back in the hands of government mm. um, and, and, tr and building that trust up and, and, and actually having um, people who are prepared to wield it responsibly in, in the service of um, something bigger than ourselves. Uh, and, and Josh, there's, there's a couple of questions about the role of social media. Um, Richard Mills from New South Wales sent in a, uh, a question uh, which says, what can governments do to reduce the spreading of extremist disinformation on mm -hmm. social media? And there's one from Joffrey Bal Balsi. Balsi. Um, does participatory democracy still have a space or does it have too much space given social media and access to it? So what's your views about the role of social media in all of this? Yeah, so the, this, that last comment really, for me, refers to the libertarian sort of dimension of the internet, which is originally what it was created for, mm -hmm. uh, extreme radical freedom of speech and action um, that was beyond the reach of government. Um, but that's not necessarily participatory democracy. There's still structures required um, for a democracy to, to really allow, not just the loudest voices to speak, for example, but to allow um, and to, fit, to enable all voices to speak. Uh, including the silent, including the vulnerable, uh, who are often drowned out in these online conversations mm. and in this polarised sort of world we now live in. Mm. Um, but when we're talking about social media disinformation, we're talking about um, or misinformation and disinformation, it, it comes back to, um, you know, it's, it's not popular, but regulation um, and the use of anonymity. Um, there's a good chance there's someone in this room who uses an anonymous Twitter account and mm. a different name. Um, and, and the fact is, is that if you can say and do something online without being held accountable for something you would be held accountable for in the streets, um, for example, if someone was to come up to me and, and abuse me online and use a different name, I, there's nothing I could do about it. But if they would come up and shout in my face in the street, well, I might have something to say. Mm. Um, and so that really we're, we've got this parallel universe and, and that really played out during the, um, the, the protest during COVID where I'd be watching the protests online, the live streams, and then I'd be watching the Telegram chat and there'd be all these people at the protest talking, moving, shaping the protest around them as I was watching the live stream. Mm. And, and yet you can't see that occurring, but it's occurring. So there's this different um, dimension now to um, temporal sort of physical dimension. So um, how did you have access to their Telegram? Um, you just got to have the app. Um, I can... Has anyone here seen Telegram? Is anyone familiar with it? Yeah, I know it. Yeah. Uh, let me, can I share a screen for two seconds? Yeah, sure. I'll just give everyone a, a small taste if it opens up. Okay, so these are all the wonderful groups that I follow and, and look at um, just to keep an eye on what they're saying and doing. I don't contribute, obviously. But let's go to the European Australian Movement. I'm blocked from them. Let's go to Craig Kelly. All right, so... What's he saying? No, he's having a go at grid girls who've been cancelled because they're transgender. You're more likely to die from Tylenol than you are in, in vermectin, something to do with drugs. So did you you just apply to be part of that? No, that anyone is, can follow these apps. Anyone can? Yeah, some they block you out of, the unshaped right. of the Proud Boys. And, and the point is this is an app that anyone can download right. and, and have a look at. And um, and contribute to, and, and then that, you can get drawn down the the rabbit hole. 
Yeah, that Freedom Rally at one point during the protest had 20,000 people active. They had live chats each night about their tactics the next day. No. Uh, the funniest part of that, I suppose, was that they were all convinced that each other were informants and um, undercover agents and uh, were constantly accusing each other of uh, <laughs> you know, uh, that sort of behaviour. But look, it's that's the world we live in now where we've got this, this new dimension to how people in, engage and interact. And there's no one using their real name on these things. Um, there's no attempt, there's no ability to regulate. You can use a VPN and you can use one of these and, and basically organise and co um, talk to, chat, uh, chat with, um, hang out so, with. Yeah. And share sorry to, yeah, sorry to interrupt, but the, the, the question was, is there anything that governments can do to sort of counter this malign effect of social media? And you mentioned um, anonymity. Um, if there were a law, a regulation that says you can only participate in these if you are identifiable, would that, <clears throat> A, would it be possible to do that? But, or B, do you think that would be effective? A, would it be possible to even enforce something like that? Well, anonymity is one. It's not popular, uh, the idea of registering um, people's real names. Mm -hmm. uh, and I suppose holding them accountable. I mean, I use my real name on Twitter. I certainly don't get caught up in anything beyond the um, odd annoyance at a referee or something um, you know, in a rugby game. But what we do see is a, um, yeah, there's certainly more got to be done in that space to at least... Um, do you think governments have thought about the idea of mandating oh, yes. personal have. identity? And it's certainly not popular. Um, mm. It's a lot of backlash. Also, regulation actually forcing um, social media companies to be accountable unto themselves. Mm -hmm. um, but again, these are these are very powerful companies. They they hold a lot of power and sway. They can shape election debates. They can shape coverage, and their algorithms can shape uh, the response. We're seeing that with Twitter play out at the moment. Is it something, do you think that uh, um, people like ourselves who might be interested in cleaning up or making social media more accountable, is it something that we should pressure governments to consider? Oh, certainly. Um, and it, it, it needs to be pressured. Now, in the um, UK, they, for example, legislated that people have to... Um, I think show ID or do some form of digital ID to be able to access porn. They're going to be over 18. Mm. Uh, I think it was the UK. And so there's these um, little developments that could occur. I, I personally think, um, uh, for example, TikTok is incredibly problematic. Um, and I'm, I'm very aware as an academic not to get caught up in the whole moral panic thing about our youth and mm. the youth today and, and so on. But, but this is um, information that's being passed unadulterated to kids and some of the content on it is, you know, pretty extreme, mm. uh, not only in its political orientation, but it's, you know, gender stereotypes, it's, um, you know, sexualization of women and, and various other things. And um, again, there's, there's zero attempt to regulate it. Now, when I was growing up, that sort of material was um, in the news agent in a certain area. Mm. Uh, it's a, you know, um, you know, wait till you're 18 if, if you were prepared to do that. But then there was, you know, nowadays anyone can access this material. It's mm -hmm. everywhere. And, and it does influence and shape. So literacy is another one. Um, I saw another comment talking about ethics in, in classrooms. Mm -hmm. um, I'm just trying to talk and keep an eye on the, uh, the comments. <laughs> but ethics um, and, and education, critical education about social media in classrooms, mm -hmm. but also extreme ideas in classrooms and, and actually provoking. But again, this comes back to parents then accusing teachers of politicizing their kids, you know, the safe schools sort of um, hysteria that occurred. And so it's all problematic. Mm. Again, it's all, uh, we, we start to see a bit of a sea change with government preparing and being prepared to actually intervene a little bit more and, and to, to step up and actually talk, um, talk back to parents. Mm. Um, then you know, we're gonna continue to face these challenges. Josh, um, I want to come back to the second of your three factors. So the three factors in your book are religion, masculinity and populism. So I just want to come back to the masculinity part. And I, I do remember um, 
as a feminist when I was quite involved in the feminist movement in the 80s and 90s in particular, I remember thinking to myself at the time that what we now need is a men's movement. Um, was that perhaps a case of be careful wash what you wish for? Well, they are, the men's rights activists would say that there is a men's movement um, and that they represent, you know, the um, challenges. I mean, it's interesting, this whole idea of the manosphere, it's an online ecosystem of groups that don't like women, um, that believe women are in some way, shape or form manipulative, coercive, control them, violent against them, and that they're victims. And it's this victimhood mentality that's really become pervasive. And, um, and in terms of men's rights activists, you know, uh, many of them are really focused on the family court or the fact that their rights of fathers have been taken away, as they see it. Um, but then you go to the extreme ends, you talk about incels, so involuntary celibates, men who um, basically say, women will not have sex with me, and so I hate women, and, and in extreme cases, um, there's been terrorist attacks by incels. Mm. Killed people because women won't have sex with them. Um, and we're talking, um, um, you know, influences like Andrew Tate, who, who talk about, um, you know, that the role of women is there to, to breed and that men, real men make millions of dollars and drive Bentleys and um, everyone else is a, is a beta male cuck. I mean, these are the basic narratives that our school kids are getting exposed to. Mm. I mean, in terms of healthy masculinities and construction, um, there is great work being done. Um, colleagues like Michael Flood, the man box and others are, are doing great work to attempt to shape that, that sort of space. But it get, comes back to schools being prepared to step in. You know, um, how much have we lost because of the cuts to education, um, particularly in our public schools over, over generations? And, and that's where the, the resources are, are lacking, although arguably not the, the misogyny is arguably not in those particular schools. Uh, it's in certain other schools. Right. But really... Yeah comes back to needing to have this whole of government approach to understanding the dimensions of all the challenges we're facing at the moment, not just talking about it as a terror threat or as a security threat, but talking about our whole orientation to you know, these, these deep challenges yeah. that are only going to get worse and, and more challenging, like environmental um, you know, catastrophe that we're facing, and, and actually look at, well, what are we going to do going forward? We need a vision and, and we're lacking that at the moment. Josh, um, I just wanted to draw everybody's attention to the fact that it's 8.30 and we normally start to wrap up then. And if anybody does need to leave us, I fully understand. But with, with other people's indulgence, because there's so much more that we can talk about, I'm going to extend this one for about 10 minutes so that we can get in a few more questions and answers, if that's okay with you, Josh. Yes, of course. Yeah. So for, for everybody else, if you need to leave, I perfectly understand. And thank you for um, sticking with us to this point. Um, I want to draw it into uh, a more of a psychological aspect. Tony Crins put in a, uh, from Victoria, put in a question um, that goes like this. In your view, does extremism come from the same process in the brain that leads to religion and superstition? Uh, in other words, a shared ability to selectively suspend critical thinking. So what, what's the, what are the commonalities between extremism, religion, superstition? Is it uh, this capacity to suspend critical thinking? in your view? I don't know exactly how it was framed. Um, I don't think it's that reductivist in, in some ways. I think um, I, I'm not an expert on neuropsych or any mm -hmm. of the things. I mean, look, religion and it's the, the conception of morality that religion has developed over um, thousands of years is at the heart of our rule of law and our society in many respects. And that's evolved from a critical engagement with text whether or not that text came from, you know, the son of God or the prophet or whatever, it's, it's an engagement with text. It's an intellectual process. And, and so to that extent that our conception of morality really um, drives to this day how we live our lives and, and the rules that we obey and, and so on. I think when we're talking about um, the, 
the, I suppose the um, whether or not it still has a role to play in society. I mean, I think secularism is absolutely fundamental and, and critical mm -hmm. because you can draw on the intellectual strengths of the various religious traditions and they all do have something to offer. But you can only do that if you have a secular government that can open its ears and, and listen to different perspectives and, and so on. So I, I, I did note in, in your book that you were um, quite strong on the necessity for secularism. But do, do you just want to talk a little bit about how what's your concept of secularism? I think my, um, yeah, thanks. Look, I think the, the major issue to go backwards, to go forwards here is textualism. Uh, it's that reading of, of text and that attempt to enact it in the year 2023 and to attempt to bring um, basically views and at, um, attitudes that had a time and place a thousand years ago or you know, 2000 years ago and to attempt to enact those exact same views without any form of contextualization now. And I think that's the major issue. I think, um, you know, there are forms of spirituality and, and religious traditions that have something to offer. I mean, they, 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 and they offer some sort of comfort to some people. And for that reason, you know, that um, I'm not anyone to take that away from anyone and, I, and so on. But I think secularism as the government maintaining a, a distance from organized religion I think um, is critical. I think it's what gives us the strength that we have as a society in, in Australia that's made us a little bit more immune to, to some of the issues that are being seen overseas in particular. But I also think that secularism um, can be problematic if, it's, if it becomes sexualist um, and becomes militant. And if we say that no one's got that right to faith that all religions full of sky fairies and, you know, and crazies and nutters. And I think the moment you start casting that aspersion then you start to feed into the polarization that has led to textualism yeah we've we've had it's always difficult to get across a clear um definition of secularism because there are actually a number of different forms of secularism as you know the more extreme form in france laicite uh, basically bans any religious symbols in the public sphere now that's not the sort of secularism that we have in australia um, and it's not the sort of secularism that there are there is in other countries either so it is a it's a fuzzy concept depending on the location yeah uh, but we, we've, in, in the RSA, we've often said we're not anti-religious, we're pro-secular, and there's a difference. Mm. So to me, secularism and to the, to the RSA is three things. It's equality of treatment um, of religious and non-religious worldviews. It's the freedom to believe or not to believe and to not have consequences if you want to change or abandon your religion. And then it's the separation of church and state. Yeah. So freedom, equality, and separation. I think if if we can get across that idea, then true true secularism is advantageous for people of faith, as much as it is for people who do not follow a faith, because it's equality between religious and non-religious worldviews. So where no one. Uh, dominates the public sphere. Look, I, I am going to have to <laughs> bring this to uh, a close because I, I'm, you've been very, very generous with your time, Josh, but I know that you've got a young family. I just want to go back to a question put in by Carly Hardy in the chat box, and I'll read it out <clears throat> if, you could, if we could finalise on this. She says, I've noticed the radicalising effect within Australia radical feminism. Uh, feminist or gender critical community. The events in Melbourne were easily predictable and while the organisers were pre-warned, they refused to take any preventative measures. Are the Christian right and CPAC disguising a wider political agenda by infiltrating and capitalising on this community? And can you offer further insight on this? Yeah, that's a really interesting um... Point. Now, I think the caveat to all of this is 
A, um, I'm a man and I'm talking about women and women's bodies. And I make that caveat uh, very seriously because I think some of the debates that are going on, um, I just need to shut up and stay out of. Um, but it's not, it's not to do with me. But B, my observations, and these are observations, um, that there are certainly um, feminists who um, are basically talking about the issue of trans, um, trans people um, in terms of, um, I suppose, the, the physical differences, but also, it's, aka JK Rowling, but also the fact that um, you know, feminism's worked really hard to, to build rights for women, and now there are people claiming the rights of women without having necessarily um, gone through any of the same hardship or struggle. That might be simplifying it, but that's that's basically one crux. But the other is obviously the use of this by the far right, and it is absolutely being exported by the far right, fundamentalist Christians and others, um, as, a, as a way of not only splintering um, the left in, in many respects, but also um, because they believe that um, trans people do not um, deserve any human rights at all. Um, they, they view them as subhuman. There's a hatred of them, uh, an absolute hatred. And you um, see that in places like Telegram? Oh, 100%. You, you do. It's, it's everywhere. And and really, you know, there is, um, for, for young people who are gender dysmorphic and, and going through that, that critical process of working themselves out to have religious activists bombarding them or, or their, their telegram and to see this incredibly damaging material mm. material is is you know from a personal level I call it despicable but from a from an objective level it is um, only ever going to be incredibly harmful to them. Mm. And that ties into this broader notion of freedom of religion and, and religious freedom that we're, we're talking about where there's this inquiry that was occurring. And I draw your attention to that because the vast majority of submissions were from um, um, you know, hard, hard right-leaning um, traditional sort of religious organisations. Um, and this only occurred recently. And freedom of religion is meant to protect religion. It's meant to protect the vulnerable to practise their faith. But it's actually being, and that's a shield, but it's being wielded as a sword. Mm. So we're now you're seeing it wielded by schools that refuse to, for example, uh, the Presbyterians who are now talking about not allowing um, gay kids to be school captain and, and so on. So there's this real push to use this freedom of religion um, sort of... In a very aggressive way. An aggressive um, sort of attacking manner mm. um, that ties into this broader anti-trans stuff. It ties into this broader seek to reclaim power because they're desperate. They are losing that battle of people, bums on seats. People so are they're not, using it cynically as a, a well, way of mobilising their base? They're attempting to mobilise a base. They feel like they're they're being um, disempowered in society. They feel like there um there's some sort of existential crisis. That there's a war on religion, hmm. and and it's not. It's in, in many ways it's a, it's an inability of them to communicate their values, or to uh, to listen to people and what people are looking for in, in faith. Um, and this younger generation, I mean, the Liberal Party are finding it out with um, the millennial generation uh, as to who 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 and um, will and won't vote for the Liberal Party now. Um, and it's the same with religion, um, particularly hardline conservative religion. Might be attractive to some young people who are looking for that sense of place. Mm -hmm. For the most part, you know, they will lose people and they will continue to lose people. Mm -hmm. uh, and and that's, um, that's an unfortunate thing because I think religion does, in, in, in some ways, have a positive role to play. Um, just as a final comment, and then I'll wrap up, uh, you may or may not know that I'm quite involved in the movement to make Australia a republic. And in thinking about why I would like Australia to have our own head of state and finally cut ties with Britain and become a republic, it, it really came down to I, I wanted to feel pride in my country. And for a number of decades, I haven't been able to feel that. I used to feel it um, in the 60s and the 70s and the 80s when I was traveling the world. Um, I used to feel proud to be an Australian, but um, I must say I don't have that same sense of pride. So to me, I want to be proud of my country as a forward looking, progressive, compassionate, open minded, fair country. I'm not saying that 
um, becoming a republic would automatically engender those sorts of characteristics. But I am saying that we need to own those characteristics. And it, it reminded me of your explanation in your book about a sort of reinvigorated sense of citizenship um, with a sense of duty and responsibility and, and valuing those things, which can seem fairly traditionalistic, even jingoistic, um, and can and we need to be careful that it doesn't um, morph into a sort of negative nationalism or patriotism. But, but there's something about patriotism that has been lost. And there's an, a positive aspect of patriotism that I think we need to reclaim and own so that we can be proud of our country and proud of who we are as a people. Mm. Um, Josh, I'm going to uh, call this to a close and thank you so much for A, for writing the book. It's a, a real, it's a ripper. And again, I encourage everybody to go out and um, buy it and read it. Um, for everybody, thank you for sticking with us. This has been a really uh, fantastic webinar. And on your behalf, thank you very much to Josh for spending time with us this evening. But with that, thank you very much, Josh, and good evening to everybody. <laughs>